Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, another wonderful Wednesday webinar for the Climate Emergency Centre Network, an ever-growing network of 24 odd uh, climate emergency centres around the UK. Um, we have an um, extremely uh, interesting talk tonight um, about uh, drug policy reform and climate justice uh, with two experts in the house, uh, Clemmie James, who's a senior policy advisor, and she's gonna tell us a lot more about the uh, the work she's doing, and Neil Woods, um, who's worked uh, in this country and, and abroad on a, a lot about you know reforming this. And we're really gonna hear about, this is the cutting edge of climate justice and climate change and why we need to change the system and change some policy. So without too much further ado, I know there's a lot to share. Clemmie's written and, and others, I'm sure, have written a massive, great big report. So, Clemmie, over to you. Lovely. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, tell us uh, what, where you're from. What's the group, the Alliance? <laughs> um, thank you. Thanks, Phoenix. And um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. It feels like two worlds aligning. Phoenix is an old friend. Um, I cut my teeth liberating buildings with Phoenix about 20 years ago for the social good. So it's really, it is a pleasure to be um, here and to talk about these two subjects, which have often been kind of kept apart. But in fact, um, hopefully by the end of the session, Neil and I will have explained how they're very much linked. Um, so um, just a little bit about how we're going to do it. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of present um, the overview and um, the issue and, and how these two areas are connected. And then um, I'll hand over to Neil. Neil um, was a former police officer and has lived experience of fighting the war on drugs. Um, so I think it'd be really helpful to understand um, from him um, the level of corruption that is is happening between these these two systems and why that's really important to climate um governance and climate justice ultimately um so i appreciate we're totally amongst friends here but something that neil and i and um, a group of now approximately 35 individuals and organizations around the world um have have sort of pulled together a coalition um, is that this issue of um, drug policy, so the, the, the rule of prohibition, uh, global drug policy prohibiting of drugs, is currently being, um, we believe, dangerously ignored by the environmental sector. So Neil and I talk in very different spaces from the UN to very much grassroots organisations trying to make these links. Um, so maybe um, I... Phoenix, I can share my screen and um, I'll take us on a bit of a journey um, and then hand over to Neil. Yeah. And um, as ever, I think that we're amongst, you know, we're, while, while Neil and I have a piece of the puzzle, a lot of you guys um, on the call will have another piece of the puzzle. So really looking forward to having a conversation afterwards um, about thinking this through. Um, so let me um, just have a... Have you made it? Is that okay? I made your co host a little while ago. I'll triple check there. There's a few more beaming in. Um, lovely. Okay. It should be a co host, make host. Yeah. So, what tell me what you guys can see? Yeah, it's, it's working. It's working. Lovely okay. to see Will's keeping in the house. Lovely. Okay. So, does that look like a loading? Yep. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> never know never know okay so what we're going to try and do is reveal the links between um two crises the crises of the the war on drugs and the, the climate crisis so um let's begin with what i believe a lot of you will be aware of and know about um we're obviously coming up to cop 28 which is going to be um in dubai where the international community is going to be assessing the global position on climate crisis. Um, yesterday, the most severe report yet um, from the UN Environmental Programme came out um, and the worst news I think we could have possibly imagined and um, they believe we might be set for a three degree increase in global warming. So there is gonna be a massive focus on looking at policies that are not serving the um, apparatus of um, of civil society and governments reducing and mitigating and adapting to climate change. So over the next five years, 
we will be seeing policies shaken out to see whether they are hindering the process of climate mitigation um, and being becoming a barrier to it, which is why this work is, is really important at the moment. So here are just a couple of quotes, one of, one of whom is the head of the UN who has really been saying that we need a dramatic shift in our systems um, to be able to, to manage um, and deal with the climate crisis. Now, um, last um, earlier this year, the IPCC, which is kind of a big, big group of scientists, I'm sure you all know about the IPCC reports, and they identified five key areas that would um, reduce um, carbon, but all to, but yeah, so slow down the climate climate crisis. Divest from fossil fuels, protect and restore forests, secure the rights of indigenous people and local communities, strengthen governance, and reduce industrial agriculture. Now, prohibition prohibitionist policies undermine four of those five top targets identified in the IPCC report. And those are protect and restore forests, the rights of indigenous people, strengthening governance and reduce industrial agriculture. Prohibition undermines four of those areas. And, and we'll, go, we'll go on to explain how they how it does that. So looking at number the second one, protect and restore forests. Um, so this is considered a, um, a natural climate solution that what we need to do right now, today, this evening is stop removing trees from around our planet. And there are some specific areas that are absolutely crucial to um, mitigating climate and, and capturing carbon in our atmosphere. Um, and those are, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, it's pretty obvious, um, the huge tropical rainforests that follow the equatorial line around the globe. So you can see those that have at the top of this little diagram, what the potential for, for capturing carbon and, and our current situation. So the reduction is enormous, but you can see still see that the line across is very much the forests and the rainforests of the Amazon, the jungles of West Africa and Central Africa, and, um, and the rainforests of Southeast Asia. Now, these carbon sinks that we should all be doing everything in our power to protect are also the same um, major drug trafficking routes and growing routes of our of 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 drugs of of the illicit drugs trade, um, and the reason um, being is is multiple. But there are a few, for example, are that um, these are plant based um, narcotics. These are these are drugs. The the, the largest um, drugs sort of size of the markets in this on this planet: cannabis, opium and um, cocaine, all derived from plants, all of which grow best along the tropics. Um, and because of the prohibitionist regime, um, in fact, it is easier to grow these um, where it can be done in a clandestine way, so hidden amongst the jungle. And here becomes the problem. So zooming away from sort of the, the, the what we need from a climate um, health, like a planetary health perspective of protecting and supporting these carbon sinks, now moving into another area of international drug, um, international policy, which is our drug laws. So our national drug laws um, are, are directed by international law, three specific UN conventions that were designed and implemented in the 60s and 70s. And the UN for the, the vision for this for the UN is what's called a drug free world. So to eradicate the production, movement and consumption of all narcotic substances. And so what has ensued over the last 60 years is what is commonly known as the war on drugs. Um, most people, um, certainly in our area and a lot of the ju social justice space um, and, and also in, and, and as Neil will, will go on to explain in in. I mean, in many, many different sectors have, have become, it is now understood that this isn't a war on drugs in any way. This is in fact a war on people. Um, and um, we know um, that this is a war on people because certain types of people are policed in certain different ways. And um, it's fair to say that for decades, you know, millennial people have been taking drugs for a multitude of reasons. 
religious, cultural uh, pleasure, medication, experimentation. Um, and um, as they have, I've sort of written here, as they have for other potentially harmful substances like tobacco and alcohol. And in terms of sort of the scale of harm, it's, it may not be that helpful to do this, but um, in terms of harm, alcohol is, is is one of the most problematic drugs and yet we have a public health regulated approach to deal with that um so we can go on to to, to what might be what what might drug reform could look like in a bit um but um it's a massive fail the war on drugs has failed mainly because the um production consumption um and uh, production consumption and movement of drugs has actually only increased in the last 60 years for all drugs so the scale is 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 like this so um the objective to eradicate has failed um and um what what I, what we're really trying to do with this work is kind of almost stop focusing on drugs but really understand that when you prohibit a when you prohibit a product or a service that people need or want um, and you make it illegal that product or service does not disappear in fact what happens is it's pushed underground and um, a multitude of opportunities arise for people to take up those the, 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 that service in an informal way without um, any regulation without any safeguarding and the cascade of harm impacts all of those within the trade and all those associated with the societies where that illegal activity exists. So what's really important is that those who are impacted by the war on drugs are not just those who grow or consume a drug, but in fact, all our communities are impacted and um, our ability to be strong, thriving communities is, is, um, is reduced because of this enormous regime um, called global drug um drug policy or pro prohibition um because of the exploitation and violence that it is required to manage this market now what pushing drugs which is such a desired product underground has done on our planet is actually created a multi-billion dollar industry again neil will go a little bit more into details around this but when i say multi-billion dollar it's it compares to the fourth and fifth largest markets on our planet. So I think it's around 600 billion a year. Um, and um, that's sort of on, in comparison to pharmaceuticals um, and textiles. It's, a, it's an enormous segment of our capitalist infrastructure. So just, just sort of keep that in mind. So here's a little diagram as to like what happens when when we prohibit something. Um, we we write the laws and we start policing it. We start we start patrolling. We start attacking. And it's a lot easier. Again, Neil will explain. It is a lot easier to focus on the low lying fruit than those that are orchestrating the mass sort of higher ends of the market where the prof the vast profits are being made. Um, so we are in, enriching and empowering certain groups of people. And I will repeat this, I hope, again in my talk, but but it's really important to, to consider that for this market to be as successful as it currently is, it is not just men in string vests that manage this market. We are talking about state and non-state actors who are very in there is extreme interest in maintaining this market. Um, whether you are um, a um, local um, port guard, you know, working as a guard in a local in a port, um, or whether you're the police, or whether you're the local mayor, or in fact, as, and and we'll go on to showing how, in fact, very high presidential level um, individuals can be caught up in maintaining and managing this trade and ultimately profiting from it, um, and so. Um, the, the repercussions is that we are harming our communities, we're destabilizing and we're undermining governance. So I'm gonna go into some, some four key areas as to how drugs, the illicit drugs market, but also the, the policies that make this market illegal are impacting the environment directly, but also impacting our ability to govern for climate justice. 
So firstly, um, methods used to grow and traffic drugs. OK, so we've we've understood that this has been pushed underground. So you can't just grow drugs like you would for corn or maize um, or other agricultural products. Um, there is a continuous game of cat and mouse in some of the most fragile regions of our planet where um, crops are dis crop crops are grown crops are destroyed by by law enforcement crops move you know uh, the growers move further up into the sort of pristine rainforest and 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 mountains and again crops are grown crops are destroyed um there is zero regulation so no one is monitoring um chemical dumping there's a huge amount of chemicals used to make cocaine no one is looking at the pollution of water um and no one is looking at the removal and cutting down of trees um small caveat coca plantation does cause deforestation but in comparison to other trades like soy um and other you know big big um sort of industrial agriculture it's in it's it's pretty insignificant it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist but it's important narrative because i think that um a lot of western countries have 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 used the sort of you just, you take cocaine you're causing deforestation what's causing deforestation isn't the product of a coca leaf that's not causing deforestation it is the policies of pushing um it pushing growers and and producers into agricultural frontiers unnecessarily and they're doing that to protect um and to avoid being caught um so zero regulation at on in the entire agricultural trade and anyone who works in agriculture on this call will understand that there's a vast amount of safeguarding probably not enough there's a vast amount of safeguarding so another area, um, direct impact on the environment, is the methods used to fight the war on drugs. So the war on drugs um, is, you know, the, the law enforcement destroys drugs through burning of clandestine lamps, of um, aerial spray, has for, for decades been using aerial spraying. There's been a, there's been a positive turn a, away from aerial spraying, but, but that is hanging in the balance in quite a few countries in Latin America if it's to come back. Crops manually being removed, and and when we when we destroy these crops, we're not just destroying the crop; we're destroying all crops in that in that in that, that area. Um, so um, these are two areas how the 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 because of prohibition, the the what's available to produce and grow these drugs is pretty limited, apart from doing it in a deeply deeply damaging environmental way. Um, so another key area. And I and, and Neil will talk about this as well. But money from the drugs trade can't be invested into banks. Fast amount of money is being moved through rainforests and very, very delicate um, ecosystems and regions where often communities are poor. And these areas are flooded by hyper capitalism, by by literal tons of money and that money has to be reinvested it's called money laundering there's different ways of understanding it but that money is reinvested into other forms of criminal activity and those areas have even further devastating impacts on the environment and they're the ones that most of us will have understood from the campaigning of our allies and, and colleagues in the environmental sector so illegal logging illegal mining expansive cattle ranching people smuggling um the drugs trade, due to its size, is the investment bank for these other extractivist, dangerously destructive economies in regions like the Amazon. So to be able to be so successful along the supply chain, um, the drug cartels are going to need to um, divert funds to, um, in, 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 you know, um, coerce communities to 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 turn a blind eye, co um, exploit um, and corrupt, bribe officials all along the supply chain. Um, that means that local governments um, and um, national governments are, if they have a vested interest in maintaining the profits from this trade, which they have done and and do, they are never going to govern for climate they, they the, the the it is the antithesis of allowing and to govern for climate would mean to leave these areas alone um and um the money that could be the money that is being spent on fighting the war on drugs the money that is um 
being spent. So, for instance, during Bolsonaro's um, presidency in Brazil, he divested money from all environmental agencies. He he, he literally decommissioned fire engines all over Brazil. So when there were wildfires, it, it he 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 had decommissioned environmental um, uh, sort of response units all over Brazil because it was in their interest. It was in their interest for the for the region to burn because of cattle ranching and ex- other extractivist industries would be able to go in. Um, and the the links between drugs, the, the, the profits of the drugs trade, um, and these other industries is 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 interlinked in these regions. Um, so here's just um, this is from the UN. Um, they themselves. This is this is this is maps showing um, the increase in um, cocaine manufacturing, but also just shows to you shows you some of the trafficking routes, right? Um, hitting the west coast of um, of um, Africa, um, regions with vast amounts of pristine, exceptionally important forests that need to be like saved. Um, and money from the drugs trade needs to be hidden, and so is hidden in illegal logging. Um, so we are seeing these patterns following the equi- um, following the tropics, um, and it is um, a, 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 like, a, it, yeah, it, it's it is undermining. Um, the call from the environmental sector to protect these regions, um, but we're not really assessing what the economic structures are in these regions. And bearing in mind, always remembering that the way, the, the power and the resources in this trade have been created by us. They, they have been created by policies. They are the consequences of prohibiting a product that all of us use. Um, so yeah, I just put this together because it's really important that we're, we're super clear. When we're talking about people in the drugs trade, there are, um, the way we police drugs is we tend to go for vulnerable communities, communities of color, um, very small um, um, consumption or production. Um, and, and we avoid um, because of the intricacies, and I don't know if anyone saw um, the mafia trials last week. Um, uh, no, this earlier this week um, in Italy, um, one of the largest mafia trials is like um, thousands upon thousands. What was fascinating about that was that it wasn't just your Sicilian mafia bosses that were being knocked up and locked up. Th- this this was white collar um, civil servants that were knee deep in the drugs trade. So um, there, there isn't that there, you know, when we talk about lobbying in the capitalist legal market, this is, this is, you know, swinging doors very much. Um, so to deliver, so sort of stepping back from, from this chaos and, and um, madness that is, that is existing as a result of drug policies in, in terms of this sort of, um, capitalism on steroids, or this shadow economy that we relate, we we talk about in our report that um, Phoenix has shared. This shadow economy is is alongside the current form of sort of structures of capitalism and and state infrastructure that we all believe and understand in. However, we are going to need extreme state responses within our public services to transition. Um, our food systems, our agricultural systems, our transport systems, our energy systems. And we are going to need governance, whether that's at a community level, a a national level or an international level, to not only have resources available to them, but that the interests of those governance, people in those government positions um, have, have the objective to protect the most vulnerable and to protect the most vulnerable regions. Um, unfortunately, um, okay, we we have now got a, a, a more sort of left-leaning president in in Brazil, but we are seeing deep, you know, however, whatever best, like the, the, with the best intentions of the world, you might have a green president in in one of these key regions in in um in Guatemala in Ecuador in Colombia um but the reality is is that governments 
don't run the Amazon at the moment. Drug cartels run the Amazon. And we need to engage head on with understanding these dynamics and understanding what's possible and what drug reform could go towards reducing that power dynamic and removing money from one sector, which is this informal sector, um, and legally regulating this trade so that this trade could potentially be taxed. Um, and, and the benefits of that um, would be to strengthen the governance, but also that tax money could be used for public services and public health and planetary health. So I'm going to um, end there and um, we'll talk about this final slide at the end when we talk about kind of what's ne what, what's needed from both movements coming together. And I'll hand over now to um, Neil, who's going to sort of come in with some um, f facts and stories. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Clemmy. That's amazing. Really informative. Over to Neil. Explain uh, Leap UK and uh, yeah, take it away. Really excited to have you here, Neil. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Phoenix, how am I? How do I t stop sharing? Oh, stop sharing screen. Can you, can you stop share down the bottom? Uh, Neil, unmute. Yeah, great. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Phoenix. And um, thanks, Clemmy. Uh, brilliant and clear as ever. Um, I'm going to talk about corruption primarily, which is actually a really difficult subject to talk about because you, I'll, I'll talk about corruption in front of some audiences and they'll just dismiss what I'm saying as, as, as in the realm of conspiracy theory. But it's really, really important to understand the extent of the corruption and the, and the vast power of organised crime because otherwise... We can't really put into context the things that we're saying. And of course, Clemmy has detailed the different areas in which uh, the current drug policy re regime of prohibition interferes with, with how we need to respond to the climate crisis. But by far the biggest issue is actually governance, because you can you can get people to sign whatever treaty, different treaty uh, you like. You can get as many promises as you want to stop putting down trees or, or to adhere to any other kind of policy response, but that signature on that policy doc on that on that treaty is literally meaningless if that government does not have the governance to carry out the agreement. If the country doesn't control their own backyard, they can't control that backyard. And the truth is, the erosion of governance from the power of organised crime has been growing steadily every single year and is actually accelerating at this moment in time. But just bear with me, I, I, I'm going to sort of take you back to the point where I became absolutely obsessed with understanding uh, corruption. So I used to work undercover, um, but so I used to catch drug dealers for a living and I was a bit slow on the uptake. It took me a long while to realise that everything that I was doing um, was actually just causing harm and that there was no 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 positive outcome to anything I did as, as, a, as a drugs investigating police officer. But when I still did believe that what I was doing was in some, some way useful, I remember I, I, I did an operation in Nottingham. Um, and I should set the scene because what I did, I, I, was, I was sort of owned by, as a, as, a, um, as a resource by the East Midlands Special Operations Unit. So they would loan me out to people around the country, um, different constabularies who wanted to do an undercover operation. And before I was loaned out, and each um, constabulary would have to bring a team together and you would have to have certain roles. So you would have to have an intelligence officer, uh, exhibits officer, backup, and all of these people in a designated model of how the operation would be run, including a senior investigating officer. Those people would be brought from their normal police duties and they would be separated completely from normal policing. And they, would, they wouldn't be carried out from a police station. It would be in a special location that only they would know about. And on the day before I got there, they would all be sat down and given what's called a lawful order. And this lawful order, they would be given it and they would be, have to sign it. And a lawful order in policing is a very big thing, it's a big deal. If you break a lawful order, you could get sacked. It's, so it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a weighty responsibility. And this lawful order was that you, weren't, you are not allowed to ask the name of the undercover operative. You are not allowed to ask any personal details where he's from, what school he went to or anything like that. And so I was using the same pseudonym. Um, and I still, I still got everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I was using um, the same pseudonym to the cops I was working with as 
I was to the people on the streets, uh, people who use drugs, the gangsters and the rest of them. Quite a lonely place, really. But, it, it, but the, the, the design of that was to keep me safe. Now, what's important to note here is that those systems where those police were not even allowed to speak to colleagues during that whole time, it could be six or seven months, it was completely separate and cocooned, like a, like a, almost like a terrorist cell, separate from everything else, to protect me, to protect me from corruption. Now, think about that. That system of a cell-like structure for investigation exists doesn't exist for any other kind of policing. It only exists for drugs investigations. So the fact that those systems exist at all is a systematic admission of the extent of the problem. The public, if the public knew that widely, they might might start questioning um, the, the 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 whole foundation of, of of what we're told about investigating drugs. So that's the first point that that is an admission of the extent of the corruption. Anyway, during this operation in Nottingham, I was tasked to get intelligence about this infamous gangster, Colin Gunn. And one day I did actually get close to him. I got, I got well, to one of his lieutenants, I got introduced to this guy. And when, when I met him, he interrogated me uh, with a knife pressed into my groin. Well, his 12 year old son was there actually, which was quite strange, having his son look on from, from the side. I think it must have been go to work with daddy day or something like that. His son was was looking on. Um, anyway, he interrogated me with this knife in the groin, which makes it conversation quite difficult. And eventually he sold me the drugs I was after. Um, I went away. But that was quite an intense day at the office. So the next morning, just before the morning briefing, I was told, and this is about four and a half months into the operation, I was told that the backup team had, had gone off sick. So I was introduced to two new police officers. I shook the hand of the first one, no problem. Shook the hand of the second one, and just the hairs went up on the back of my neck. Instinctively, I knew that this guy was wrong, and I didn't trust him instantly. So I went to the senior investigating officer and said, look, boss, I cannot go out today knowing that this guy's part of this operation. I don't trust him. So the boss was great. He said, right, we'll exclude them both. We'll just run shorthanded, and he will never know anything about it. So I put it out of my mind. I was relaxed. He wasn't he, he wasn't part of the operation. Twelve months later, when Colin Gunn, the, the infamous gangster, was actually caught, it turned out that this police officer that I'd taken an exception to, um, a man called Charlie Fletcher, was actually an employee of Colin Gunn. He was part of the he was part of the gang, the gangsters. And he'd been paid to join the police. And he'd been in the police for seven years. He was being paid two thousand pounds a month on top of his police wages, plus bonuses for good information. And this is about 2003, so quite a lot of money. But he was paid to join the police and it was really accidental that he got caught. In the debrief for that operation, I spoke to many senior officers and they said to me, look, Woodsy, we know this happens. Of course this happens. With this much money involved, how can it not happen? So there is an acceptance and understanding in senior police of this, that this level of corruption exists. And as I've said, the systems are in place to try and tackle it, but it didn't protect me. Those systems didn't, and they can't, because we cannot adequately defend against this corruption. But it's not just the value, probably about £10 billion a year, the value of the illicit drug markets in the UK. It's not just the value in the market. It's the fact that we try to police drugs in this regime. Because it's actually the cops trying to police drugs which are causing the corruption. It's not just the value. I'll explain. Say there's a successful, and I use that in the loosest possible term, a successful uh, raid where a kingpin character or a major gang is caught in, say, in one half of Birmingham, uh, a gang that controls the heroin and crack cocaine supply in one half of the city. That creates an opportunity in the market because the market stays the same. The market's not not shrunk, so someone else is going to be going to be taking that up, taking up that opportunity. The gang or kingpin character that is most able to take up that opportunity is somebody who already has a share of the market. So someone perhaps who controls the other half of the city. So what the policing does is it creates monopolies. 
We are constantly, by policing drugs in these illicit markets, we are constantly sharpening the sword of organised crime. We're making it more effective. We're making it more ruthless. We're also creating monopolies. And where we don't create monopolies, we force people to work together for their efficiency. So we create cooperatives. It's described and plays out very well in the, in the TV series The Wire, which is entirely based on true facts, by the way. But so these cooperatives and monopolies have been growing steadily and stabilising for decades. Now, of course, at street level, you still have chaos. In fact, now we have 50,000 children dealing heroin and crack cocaine on the streets streets of the UK, a well done prohibition. Um, so you still have chaos at the street level, but a couple of steps up from the street, you have very stable, professional, organised crime, which are becoming more effective all the time. And this monopolization effect as a result of policing happens at every level all over the world. So, for example, the National Crime Agency just three years ago announced, and why they did this publicly, I don't know. I thought it was quite strange, but they did. They announced publicly that they had information that British organised crime groups uh, had teamed up with Dutch organised crime groups and some parts of the Italian Mafia for the first time. So it's a cooperative between people that would normally be at odds with each other. But what this means when you get these cooperatives is they pool resources. They pool corrupt resources. But most importantly, if you're a monopoly, if you've got a bigger share of the market, you have more disposable income. And if you have more disposable income, organised crime will always, always invest that in corruption because corrupt assets are their most important part of the business model. They're most important. If you've got corrupt assets, it protects you from being arrested, from prosecuted, from put in jail. It protects you from investigation. You can direct your co your your um, your uh, competitors to be investigated instead. If you've got more corrupt assets, it means that you can more effectively move your drugs around. And the higher up and the the, the, the more expensive the corrupt assets, the more efficient it is because it's more effective to, for example, corrupt a chief of police than it is an individual customs officer. Because if you've got the chief, you've got all the customs officers. So all of the time that we're policing drugs, we're making organized crime more refined. We've made them more transnational, more cooperative, more efficient. We've reduced their costs. We reduce their outlay because, because corrupt assets can make their whole business run much, much more smoothly. There are other examples. Um, there used to be several drug dealing gangs in Mexico, dozens. Now there are three super cartels. And those three super cartels have a bigger GDP than most West African countries. And if we look at West Africa, what those what transnational organized crime is doing in West Africa is it's completely taken them over. There are now many, many narco states, but much of West Africa is entirely taken over. They are, there is no longer any legitimate governance in Guinea-Bissau, Senegal, Guinea, for example. Now, Guinea is a very important example because in, in April 2021, Guinea had, had, had become a new emergent democracy, a shining example to many of the other um, countries in West Africa. And in April 2021, Guinea made the announcement that they were entirely stopping any logging. They were kicking out the logging firms. They were stopping deforestation because they were taking their climate responsibilities seriously. Everyone cheered. In September, there was a military coup to get rid of that democratic government. And literally within a few days, Guinea had gone back to being the, the, the fastest deforestation in Africa and possibly the fastest in the world. They had been that way two years prior to that announcement in April, 2021. That coup was financed by drug money. Now it's complex and it's, it's complex to unpick and I am making that statement, not by quoting a document, but I am interpreting various things that I've read and listened to and different policing sources I've spoken to. That military coup was about taking control back to control um, the, the bribery money that's coming in from the cocaine trade across the Atlantic, but also so that that drug money could be reinvested into other forms of illegal activity, including environmental crime, in order to double up the profits and make more money. The, the army that's in control of Guinea is now the biggest drug gang 
in Guinea. That's paid for by the drug money. Now, another thing that is, is quite difficult to say to some audiences, even some audiences within the drug policy world, is that many development organizations or people with a development head will want to talk about the illicit economies because they're also, they want to paint the picture that the illicit economies are interlinked, it's complicated, it's not just drugs. If we, if we, if we took legal control of the drug markets, the gangsters are still do gangster things. No, no, there's an absolute core of bullshit in, that, in the way that that's presented. That is prohibitionist thinking. Absolute bullshit because for example, I've, I've seen, I've been looking at various um, uh, estimates of the value of the illegal mining um, industry in Latin America. There are various estimates, but the most common estimate I've seen is that it's worth 3 billion US dollars a year. The estimated value of the cocaine market from Latin America is anything between 130 and 200 billion US dollars a year. So even 3 billion value in the illegal gold mining trade is still a drop in the ocean in comparison to the cocaine trade, a drop in the ocean. But the important thing to talk about when we talk about comparing the size of these markets is that most of these environmental crimes and environmental businesses require investment for them to happen. So the, the value of the three, 3 billion gold mining, that's the value but that's not the profit because there's a lot of investment needs to happen in order for gold mining to happen the investment for all of the associated environmental crimes comes from the drug trade all of it and it's not just the fact that there's a huge amount of money which can get reinvested because obviously the investment of money gives is power in itself but think about this i've referred already to narco states there are narco states in west africa there are also narco states in Latin America. Uh, Honduras has been a, a recognized narco state for a long time. Uh, Venezuela certainly has elements of being a narco state. We're watching Ecuador descend into a narco state almost on a weekly basis. And it's a, a, a horrendous tragedy that we're, we're seeing happen. But it's a narco state. It's not a gold mine state. It's not a deforestation trade state. The money which has corrupted governments in those states is not the value of the money from cattle ranching. It's not the mon the value from the money deforestation. It's not the value of the money of mm. gold mining. Yes, there's a lot of money in those things, but there's not enough money to take over an entire state. And can yeah. I just can I just add something, yeah. Neil? Just just also because I just think this anal anal analogy is helpful. Is that it's not it's not alcohol industry or tobacco industry or pharmaceutical industry that is that is corrupting um these entire governance structures either so just in terms of like i know it's really helpful to look at the the sort of the the environmental criminal crime industries but also just to think about like these other enormous trades that that, that can can cause harm to people but um have um extremely tight regulation and and are not and are not having the same impact in these regions at all exactly and that is a very good point clemmy and we do have to compare that and look at coffee as well you know co coffee is one of the one of the most sought after drugs um in the world and it is regulated we could regulate it better there are aspects of the of the coffee business where we could tweak it through regulation to make it better for the environment but we can consider those options because it's legal because we already have some regulations in place that we can tweak and change and adapt to the requirements um, that, that policy problems pre present to us but it's it's so it's but it's key and it's why i wanted to start with explaining why i how i came into understanding and being obsessed with trying to understand corruption because there is, of course, the risk of demonising the global south and talking about how corrupt narco states exist there. But this is a global business. This is a global business where indigenous indigenous land rights have been uh, being shredded by a global business. And actually, the, the the heads, the people who are making the most money from these these pyramids of transnational organised crime, are in the global north, and the corruption exists everywhere. 
And when we talk about it, and the report does this very well, so I encourage you, please do have a look at the report. We need to see it in terms of a massive shadow economy, but it, it is difficult. It is really difficult to get an audience to pay attention to this because people don't feel affected by corruption. It's very difficult for people that they, they, they feel secure in their homes or secure in their, in their democracy uh, to actually believe this. But there was a report at the same time as that military coup was going on in September 2021. Um, there's an organisation which studies transnational organised crime. It's called GTOC, uh, the Global Initiative into Transnational Organised Crime. And it came out at the same time as that military coup. And this, the report they brought out was extraordinarily brilliant. A lot of their work is great. But most of the work that they do is like, it's like telling a joke without the punchline. They give you all this incredible information, but without pointing the finger and, and, and revealing that actually drug policy is the cause behind all this. But they can't do that because of their funding. But in this report in 2021, they made the declaration that the growing power of transnational organised crime is the single biggest threat to our democratic way of life and our security. The single biggest threat. Now, I've heard the same thing said for the climate crisis being the single biggest threat to our security and our democratic way of life. But what Clemmy and I are here to point out to you today, that those two things are the same. They are the same thing, absolutely, inexplicably linked and feeding into 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 each other um yes clemmy did you want to add something to that you're on mute sorry i, I just know that we haven't got much longer um and i just wanted to add I'm running, running over a little bit this is such an important subject and you two are both absolute boss don deep knowledge sharers so but obviously people have got a certain amount of time. So uh, share a bit more and then we'll do some questions and you can keep sharing. I don't mind running for an hour and a half if people do want, because this is one of the most important conversations we can actually really try to inject into the climate justice environmental movement, because exactly what Neil's just saying, these things are intrinsically linked to the destruction of the frontline rainforest with, you know, organised crime and the money going into... Uh, yeah, uh, over to Clemmy, back to Neil, and then for some Q&As. Oh, oh, just... Go on, go on, Neil. I was just going to do like about four sentences sort of summary, to be honest. Although I'll just um, so a quote from that same. Now I said that that because of the funding, GTOC don't include uh, policy recommendations around drugs, but they slipped in one sentence. They snuck it past the funders in that report, and the, this one sentence paragraph said, in in terms of the recommendations, he said we call for the global reset of drug policy. Now I agree. There is, and there is no other way, and I, I cannot emphasise how important that is, that I, I honestly believe we cannot deal with the climate crisis at all because of this effect on governance around the world unless we tackle drug policy. So we have two choices, really. We either um, legally regulate the trade to take away the power from organised crime so all of that vast wealth goes towards governance and can strengthen our climate response so that these drug markets work for the planet and not against them. Or if we're waiting for governments to get to catch up with us on that, we have to talk to organised crime because they've got grandchildren too, right? But I'll leave it there and, and see if Clemmy's got any other any summarising thoughts. Leave, before it, we leave it there on that epic, <laughs> epic <laughs> um, Yeah, I mean, um, I, I just I really wanted to just sort of like pull pull this together, which is that um, the, the 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 big concern we have is that the very popular rhetoric is 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 to um, militarize and and um, g it, and have a war on illegal miners on illegal loggers, and that is what we're seeing in in the Amazon, for for example. Um, so I think it's really important that we have learned these lessons that going to war with a product is um, always going to have an impact at, at, because it will because it's people and the environment that are going to be um, the victims of of that militarization. Um, so we can't go to war with nature and um, and we can't regulate nature without regulating the economies that run through nature. 
Um, so what we have been doing with this coalition, so we're a coalition and um, we're, we're growing, we're a coalition of people from the drug policy movement, from the environmental movement, um, and our, we are working towards COP30, which is in 2025, and that's going to be in the heart of the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, um, because we don't think that the international community will be able to ignore this issue um, when it's hosted in the Amazon. Um, but unfortunately, and this isn't like, I don't mean to sort of like bash the environmental sector because I see myself in, in that space. We are being told through campaigns by Greenpeace, WWF, Friends of the Earth, we are told half the story. We are told the story of illegal mining, illegal logging. We're told about the destruction of the rainforest. But because of the stigma around talking about drugs and the associated stigma of talking about drug policy reform, no one wants to touch this. So we have been working on um, advocating, asking for meetings with, the, you know, that is that we are advocating behind the scenes to encourage the big environmental NGOs that have the ear to the public to add drug policy reform to their agenda. Now, they can be part of designing those solutions. In fact, we very much are going to need the agrarian justice people, like experts, the ecologists, the supply chain experts, all those that have worked in trade justice, making supply chains fairer. As Neil said, that there isn't really an example of a trade that is like ultimately, um, you know, harm free. Um, but there is an opportunity to legally regulate drugs. It is happening. Um, just to leave that on a positive note, it is happening. It's happening quickly with um, cannabis. It's happening quickly with um, psychedelics. The problem is how it's being regulated and whose interests are being championed. And that's why it needs and requires a social justice lens. Um, but just to give you an example that cocaine is not a way off, you know, blue sky thinking, the Colombian, um, the Colombian um, government had a reading, a fourth reading for a legal regulation bill to, to regulate cocaine. Um, and that was only last year. So it, I, I believe that in the next five years, we will see legally regulated cocaine. The problem is that it cannot happen in isolation. If it only happens in Colombia, the trade will balloon and be moved to Peru or Bolivia. So we we do, this is an international issue, but, but the most important thing is that it gets hosted and housed within the environmental space that people move away and legitimize talking about drug policy um, in in a bold but also a, a common sense approach that this is about our public health and our planetary health i'll, I'll leave it there beautiful Thanks. absolutely smashed out of the park both of you guys this is a big and long debate we've got some heavyweight thinkers in the house uh, stick your hands up in the uh, down the bottom of the reactions thing. You can put your hand up. Helps you. One, two, three. Uh, we've got deep thinkers from from Ireland to Oregon to Froome. Mr. Will's keeping in the old school first off the blocks. What's he think? Deep thinker. Thanks very much. That was really really interesting. Um, great to meet you guys uh, again. I think in some cases. Um, just want. I was really interested in your last point, uh, Neil, which was saying that there, may, there may be an opportunity or some kind of way to engage with the. Um, if not with the governments, with the drugs trade itself on this subject. And obviously, I like the idea of something which is really topsy-turvy like that um, as a sort of strategy to deliver comms. I'm just really interested in how realistic that was or if that's a, um, you know, like that's the only other option as such, which is obviously not real. So I'd just like, love to understand that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so... The problem is with the international drug treaties is that um, change is really slow, even though the Pandora's box has opened and we can see that the United States is the first nation to go against those treaties. So we know we can break those treaties and we know we can under have uh, innovation in different countries. However, because those treaties are in place, that's going to slow down governments wanting to innovate. So while we wait, we have to think, well, how can we reduce the harm in the meantime? And one way is actually approaching people who 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 actually run the trade at the moment. And there is actually precedent for this. So the Colombian government did some really bold and brilliant peacemaking when they decided to negotiate with the FARC and then the civil war in Colombia. The FARC being at that time the most important uh, cartel in terms of growing, controlling a lot, a lot of the cocaine trade. Now, that ending of the civil war hasn't, uh, as the United States hoped, 
had any impact at all on the cocaine trade. In fact, in the last 12 months, the cocaine this, the cocaine supply worldwide has gone up 35%, and the price of the wholesale coca leaf is down by 70% in 12 months. So we are seeing some very rapid and dangerous changes in the market. So that hasn't worked with the FARC. However, it doesn't mean that we can't, but it still sets a precedent for how we can actually talk to cartels. And if you listen to some of the uh, rhetoric from the new Colombian president and also um, new, new Brazilian president, they are talking about peace. They are talking about peacemaking, particularly in Colombia. And we've, Clemmy and I have spoken to, um, in fact, we spoke a lot, spoke alongside the Colombian representatives at the UN this year, and they are talking about peace, looking for peaceful solutions to these problems. And that I find incredibly encouraging because, you know, the, this these are business people. They wanted to make money, but also, you know, you, you have to assume that the, there has to be some kind of trade off. That it, if they're trade, if we if we accept we can't stop the trade, which we can't because the several decades of prohibition proves that to us, then surely we have to be started to make re, uh, some kind of harm reduction measure in that trade. And we can only do that by communicating with those in charge. So we have to completely change our view of. Uh, these people, these caricatured figures, you know, these string vest figures, as Clemmy uh, so colourfully describes it. Um, I'll just add something which, um, um, Will, like maybe it is, maybe for now it is the comms, like, um, you know, maybe, maybe we use that in in the comms way because, um, but, but at some point they are um, stakeholders in this invisible table right so we 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 have to think about the table and who needs to come to the table to um govern for climate justice like who is impacted by this who's going to need protecting more than who you know what how are the financing um how are we going to finance all this so th th they are stakeholders in this future um and and as we said they run a lot of these forests um but currently um, the COP last year failed to mention drug policy. The IPCC reports don't mention drug policy. An enormous report came out today about um, crime in the Amazon fails to mention drug policy. So um, the the th there is a there is a stigma around talking about these groups as if they don't exist. So as if the shadow economy just simply doesn't exist. And that I think is our first breakdown in terms of like really trying really reframing that this trade isn't going away and it is impacting and will become a barrier to some of the wider climate agenda you know areas on climate agenda particularly around protecting forests and indigenous groups um, go on let me you wanna... i just want to make one more point which is about climate financing which we didn't make but um, we will see a huge amount of pledges around climate financing in the next two weeks um, in Dubai or the next three weeks, whenever it begins. Um, the UK government gave £80 million to the Amazon Defence Fund this year. Norway gives money. Switzerland gives money. Germany gives money. There's going to be a vast amount of money in um, climate, in sort of climate reparations. Now, that money, without being utterly crude, is pissing money up the wall. Because while we have prohibitionist policies in these key regions, what is that? What is that money doing? Um, so we, we have systems that is an antithesis of that money to be received. That money can't even be sucked in and received and distributed amongst communities because the governance isn't there. Oh. So yeah. Okay, I'm just going to bang a quick one and uh, come over to Paul. I think it's got a question. If you do want to uh, stick your hand up in the reactions or physically, um, just to say, you know, as as, a, as an activist for 30 years, I know Shane's done a lot of campaigning with the Cannabis Festival, um, you know, the police uh, inspector, Brian Paddock and others campaigning. You know, how do we build an effective campaign to change this prohibition? Prohibition did not work for alcohol folks in america it, it fueled you know uh, some big uh, gangster mafia things over there and you know more than alcohol this is destroying the front lines of a rainforest and i think my key takeaway from this from listening to clemmy and having a skin food report and things is and what i've tried to explain to a few others before this on the 
on the chats is that, you know, it's not the government in the capital that control what is going on in the front line of the rainforest destruction. It is the drug cartels and the poor people who, who will do whatever they need to do. And forest is getting slashed and burnt to grow this stuff. How do we create policy change? How do we stop prohibition? How do we do it fairly and equitably and in a social just way? And this should be something that the whole environmental movement gets behind for that big climate summit uh clemmy mentioned and how do we effectively campaign any ideas feedbacks comments doesn't have to be a question give me feedback paul over paul unmute yeah hey well thank you for yes hello i'm uh calling from oregon i am right now working uh in the cannabis industry here <laughs> have been working in cannabis for um more than 32 years, um, but my focus is on climate change and cannabis. And oh. what people need to understand is, yeah, I wrote uh, Cannabis Versus Climate Change, which I posted a link in the chat. And I also made a film called Cannabis Versus Climate Change, because if we don't fix climate change, then it won't matter what we do fix. And we only have a very, very limited amount of time left to make a difference if it's not too late already. And so what we need to do is we need to cut to um, the most direct protocol uh, under emergency preparedness conditions, which is essential civilian demand. We're not asking for permission to make fuel and food from cannabis. We are using cannabis to produce what we need because it's the only crop that produces complete essential nutrition in the seeds and clean abundant energy from the stems it's the only one that means we're not inducing food insecurity by growing our own fuel and people need to understand that cannabis is unique in this way at the same time it's the only crop that produces enough atmospheric aerosol terpenes to replenish what's been lost with the deaths of the boreal forests and the marine phytoplankton which used to produce twice the volume of atmospheric aerosol terpenes as they do now that reflect UVB radiation away from the, the, the planet and serve as cloud condensation nuclei. There's a, there's a, a, a whole distraction element to what's happening. The, the drug war is being used as a front for the fossil fuels industry because the, the drug trade is a multi-billion dollar industry, no doubt about it. But the fuel industry is a multi-trillion dollar industry, multi-trillion. And that's what we're being, that's what we're fighting against. We um, need to be making our fuel and our food from the same organic harvest. That's, that's my message. And I trust that people will check out my work. I've been teaching the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization about hemp seed nutrition since 2003. And they didn't want to know. <laughs> so understand that we are all born into institutional slavery and everything that we're fighting against is meant to perpetuate that slavery. And so if people are interested, I'm available. You have my email in the chat. Um, I'm available to speak uh, live stream. I presented at the World Economic or at the uh, sorry, the uh, World Hemp forum in Slovenia since my, or 2015. I wrote the manifesto for the world's first cannabis college in Amsterdam. And Brilliant. I have planted cannabis publicly twice uh, since 1992 and demanded to be arrested for something that can't possibly be truly illegal because it's both unique and essential. So no Brilliant. court has rightful jurisdiction over it. Paul, Thanks wait, for wait, inviting wait. me to speak. We're going to get you in to do your own webinar, Paul. There's a similar person you've got to meet, Rob Free Cannabis in uh, in Britain that Shane knows well. Um, fascinating conversation. We'll talk to, we'll we'll come talk back. to Sam um, Cannon. You know Sam okay. Cannon? And I want to hear about Oregon a bit later about what they're doing with the money from the hemp shops that's funding all their good social programs. Number one solution for climate, food, fiber, fuel, medicine. Shane, University okay, Challenge. Well, I'm going to have to get back to work now. So thanks for inviting me to speak and I'll, I'll talk with you later. We'll be in touch, Paul. Let's book you in. Yeah. Good. Find Sam Cannon. He's in London. Send us a link. He knows all about me. Okay. Sam Cannon in London. He uh, 
uh, was at COP whatever, 20, whatever it was, but uh, Beyond the Green. He's the guy who uh, coordinated Beyond the Green. Please cross-pollinate, guys. I'm going to stick some things into the chat about how you connect with this network. Over to Shane. Thank you much, Paul. That's brilliant. Shane. Yeah, very quickly. My first question had already been asked, but uh, the second one, you, you were talking about sort of um, coalitions and such. <laughs> um, uh, Zoe Garbutt, who is the Green mayoral candidate for the Mayor of London Assembly elections next May, she's been very, very involved in the Green Party Drugs Policy Group. Um, and, you know, really knows her stuff and the, the Green Party drug policy has been updated since we did it at the turn of the century. And it's now really quite detailed for all the different drugs. But um, I, I really hope, well, I, I know that the, the London Assembly elections, are, we are going to try and make drugs a much, much bigger issue. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, very keen to be part of a, a coalition, get stuff going on it and, and because most other parties are just terrified of it and uh it's so relevant in particular in london today um and uh sorry to say i missed the first 20 minutes half hour but um fascinating to uh to hear clemmy and see clemmy again after decades and and hear neil speak for the first time at last i've heard a lot about you thanks both very much brilliant Thanks, can I just respond to that briefly? Uh, yeah, we, we, we know Zoe. I had, had a chat with Zoe about this at the Anyone's Child Lobby Day in June. And uh, the person who now runs the Green Party Drug Policy um, Group is Cara Lavin, who's also part of Anyone's Child, and she's she's good friends as well. So I am in contact with them, and we are intending to do what we can to support um, Zoe's position during that campaign. Great. Brilliant. Shane's done a massive amount of work on this front from, from the early Cannabis Festival. Um, yeah, let's cross-pollinate, folks. Paul, Jay Von Hartman. I have to unmute, Paul. Yep. Yes. I, I just finished speaking. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. Sorry. Yes, it's different to the uh, hands to that there. OK, so what's to say, folks, like, um, you know, one thing I really want to labour here, it is the number one climate solution. Paul's touched on it a bit and he's done a video and the thing, but it is, you know, the emperor wears no clothes on food, fibre, fuel, medicine. It's, you know, hemp absorbs 20, you know, 20 times the amount of CO2 of, of an acre of trees. It's not just about there's different what are called drugs now are actually plants. And to have a war on drugs, to have a war on plants is madness. Prohibition didn't work before. So how do we change the system? This is part of system change and it will be a fair and more equitable and socially just system rather than persecuting the poor people like, um, you know, Neil was saying the low hanging fruit. There are very high up people who are keeping our economy going and, and, and putting a lot of corrupt money into different governments. Over to Zoe. Lovely to see you over the Cornish uh, team. Over. Hiya. Yeah, cheers. Really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, I suppose I've got a question about you were saying it's like stigma that stops people talking about or taking action on the drugs <clears throat> policy issue. But I'm wondering if it might also just be fear of, because if it is so interconnected, it won't just be in those other countries, you know, it'll be in our government here and in institutions and, you know, the way you were speaking about the policing. And I'm just wondering in some of the charities, um, campaigning groups, journalists, I don't know. I mean, it, is it more than just stigma? Um, yeah, really good question. I mean, it, it, it is fear as well. Um, one of the reasons we set up this coalition is for the anonymity of colleagues in vulnerable positions. So in our coalition, there are env environmental defenders and um, and colleagues who, who can't um, who can't talk about this in their countries. Um, so again, it's this it's it's about pulling together so that there is a sort of global voice um, and um, where we can shoulder some of that risk um, speaking collectively. Um, I mean, in our report, we, we're quite hard at the end by saying that some of these global NGOs that are headquartered in the global north, particularly Europe and America, could do some of the leverage and heavy work of beginning to talk about drug reform now listen i would love to see greenpeace talk about legally regulating the drugs trade i don't think that's going to happen soon 
but talking about drug reform to address an economic system that is a barrier, I think we could start getting environmental organisations to use language that means the same thing, but that doesn't spook people. Um, and that is what that is what our coalition is about is is working from from a policy perspective, but also a comms perspective and um, looking at how to sort of yeah re reframe some of this so that those who um, can feed some of this content um, aren't at risk and and serious risk right there there uh, are some of our colleagues are at serious risk um and we've got we've got colleagues who are from global witness wwf but who won't be named because they they don't they don't feel safe in their organizations to talk about drugs. you know it is insane we, what what we really have to get across is the links and that without understanding and analyzing um this economy um hey. Yeah, without and we 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 are we are only going to be doing half half a good job. Well, I finished all the boxes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now I'm down to just sorting just through the silence. Uh, I can't. It's my fault. Carry on, guys. Muting. Um. Uh, but, I mean. Brendan. Yeah, I a bit before I worked on drugs and environment, I I worked on drugs and I think Will asked about um sustainable development goals, um and you know amazing work like our colleague magdalena is on the call who's been ex doing extraordinary work with within human rights and drug policies um i th the, the the good news is that the evidence is on our side that policing and fighting the war on drugs causes harm to communities and there's a plethora um, a, a, you know a canon of evidence to suggest this it is the stigma that's that is the success of the drug wars has been the stigmatization um, and the comms of 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 making us all believe that that drugs um, are bad and evil, and and not understanding it as an economic market um, and system that's been that that has been created, um, and and I think looking back, I mean, it may or may not be useful, but looking back at the history of prohibition of alcohol and seeing sort of the rise of organised crime during those twenty years of prohibition, and 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 then the you know it, it it's it's in it's in our film cultural what we need is is a is 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 a collective um approach where we have the artists the filmmakers the journalists the ngos like we we need to have that collective approach to uh destigmatizing this issue and and yeah sorry just babbling okay. no can it's I really just... really important zoe can I come just quick follow up? Yeah. So, I mean, I know that Shane and I, we're both town councillors and I'm wondering if there's anything that councillors can do as well. Well, are you with, um, are you with uh, affiliated with a party? Uh, just about. Because um, I spoke to some councillors here and there who have asked the same question. And we wondered if there is a way of getting together with other people within your party who are aware about this and maybe having some kind of regional event because if we could sort of um encourage a collection of different local local politicians to come together and listen to this then that that's a big ripple in the pond isn't it because you know you you good people who take the time to be councillors you're talking to a lot of people so maybe there's some kind of way of organizing a collective event in a region I'd, I'd also say this is pretty much a cross-party issue right so Neil and I have done a lot of work in within Labour and the Tories and, and Green to, as well um, and my organisation was sort of part of helping write I wasn't at, in the job at the time but helping write the Green Manifesto for Drug Policy so I, it, there are there are individuals within all these parties that for different reasons want to legally regulate drugs right um, so I think it's what's really important is that we need the experts who have worked in other fields, trade justice, tax justice, environmental justice, um, p policy, uh, police reform. Like we, we need those perspectives. Um, if it's just going to be down to like me and Neil to, ref you know, I'm just, I'm joking, I'm not Neil, but like if it's just, if we stay in our silos, then we're not going to get the richness of learning from how, how exploitative other legal trades have been regulated. This is the opportunity to regulate from scratch. 
I, I think um, just a quick one, that Paul, I think that's got another one there. And, um, you know, we need to take an intersectional approach, which means that this affects lots of different things as a translation there. And, you know, this really affects poor people all over the world. It's a, you know, it, it's a real big issue for lots of groups and it affects our governance and our democracy and the, you know, the front line of the destruction of the lungs of our planet and the environmental social justice movements need to realize and link all this up link the dots because it's really really important what's going on here let's keep the ball rolling there's a whatsapp and a telegram chat in, there in the uh, chat channel keep keep the conversation going i think paul's got another point now i just wanted to quickly big up we've got groups coming tonight from all over from ireland from oregon from the uk from warsaw uh, as an african country there the brother please post your your groups in the chat and let's keep networking to each other paul was that another or any others coming on feedback as well anything paul Yes, I just wanted to mention that before I started Project Peace in 1991, I was the director for whoops, Sea Shepherd Hawaii in uh, from 19, 1988 until 1991. And when I learned that you could make fuel from cannabis, I understood that that's the real motivation for the prohibition. And we need to start talking about cannabis as a strategic resource. Cannabis has been identified in the United States as a strategic resource in seven presidential executive orders signed by seven different American presidents since 1942. It's important to understand that hemp was banned two years before Hitler invaded Poland because cannabis is a strategic resource that fueled our ships that carried troops to Europe to fight against the Nazi. Uh, Harry Anslinger was a, a Nazi operative embedded within the American government. And there were many racist uh, Nazi sympathizers in the United States that all used their influence and their racist uh, agendas to undermine uh, a strategic industry. In 1942, the War Department finally convinced Franklin Roosevelt that we couldn't win the war without hemp. And the same is true now. We can't win the war against climate change without the only crop that produces the atmospheric aerosol terpenes and sequesters the most carbon and produces the most oxygen while improving the soil, the water, the air, and, the, and helping wildlife. Not to mention redistributing the true wealth of the world when did it ever become okay to burn petrochemicals to make energy? When did that happen? It happened before any of us were born. We were born into water. That's why we don't know what water is. And so <laughs> it takes a head to get ahead. You have to think outside the bong about cannabis because we've been throwing the baby food out with the bong water. So, you know, <laughs> 32 years of thinking about this has, generated too many sound bites and too many links so if you email me i will send you too many links and you're welcome uh, to the sound bites <laughs> thanks for letting me speak I'm, <laughs> I'm booking you in for your own webinar january or february paul uh we've been long-term campaigners and it is you know you can replace uh, the, you know your, your engines can be run on hemp which means we don't need all the fossil fuels so if more the uh, you know, end to oil campaign has got behind hemp. We would be a lot further along. Christine, over to the revolting artist team. Thank you for the Oregon massive. Ah, uh, yeah. Thanks, guys. That was really, really interesting. Um, I kind of didn't know whether to kind of say anything because it's not really a positive outlook. Even though, yeah, I just think I totally agree about like the global reach of the club. You know, the crime networks being a huge issue. I just think that people know you know and I think that the you know the people right at the top they know and they are corrupt you know you know if you think about Boris how close was he to all the Russians and stuff you know it's not about raising awareness because they, they know and that's not a really constructive thing to say you know but yeah so it is absolutely a huge issue I totally fundamentally agree with that you know and uh, yeah, we do need to, and we don't have the teeth. We don't have any way to govern and fight against their speedboats and all. Do you know what I mean? Like we're toothless against this kind of criminals. And again, 
I just don't have that hope that you have about the ability to work with these people. I think, you know, the whole point of regulating the industry, the whole point of, you know, a, you know, deprohibition is so that we can then choke the cartel and decrease the violence rather than, you know, work with them. I know they are stakeholders, but the point should be that they're not. <laughs> they get off the table because they are violent, dangerous, horrific people that, you know, I think the process has dehumanized, not dehumanized them, that's not the word, desensitized them. You know, mm -hmm. I think we've got a long way to go to reach those hearts if they, the brutality they've been through psychologically, it's got to have such a massive impact on their brain, you know, on their psychology that they don't think like us. It's a brutal world that they've been in that it's really mm -hmm. ambitious to reach their hearts. <laughs> But yeah, from, yeah well, we need to decriminalise it, regulate it, take control of it, take control away from them. <clears throat> yeah, right, Christine, how that, how that happens, how it gets deregulated and the, and the policy change is really important. I think we've got Will on number three with a physical hand and then Doug was number four over and we'll maybe give it another 10 minutes, guys, or so but could get it keep rolling because it is really important conversation. So I don't mind if it flows. If people do need to be email, you can go. Make sure you've got an email for us. Tune in next week. We've got Community Climate Action with Jules. Put it in the chat. Over to Will, who is a um, person who, who, who's done a lot with the uh, environmental movement. Maybe you can help to get this into the uh, mainstream of the environmental movement, Will. I'd, and then I'd, love to think, I'd love to think I have that kind of power, but um, it's a very super interesting topic. I just wanted to, since we've got you on the call, obviously, um, to find out more about the synthetic drug trade and how that relates to this, because there's obviously sort of two parts. There's things, you know, just in general, um, and maybe you could mention to novices like me what that is and the scale of it in comparison to what we've been talking about. Yeah, OK, so there's various um, parts of the market which are synthetic. If you look at the traditional synthetic markets like uh, drugs like amphetamine and uh, MDMA, they bring their own environmental problems, particularly in places like the Netherlands. So, for example, most many most of the Dutch rivers have been contaminated by chemicals that are the waste product from the MDMA, MDMA industry. So you've got the sort of local and regionalized impacts of the of the trade. However, even though the, those sort of real time uh, direct uh, environmental damage has happened from those trades, it's still tiny in, in comparison to the impact of the power of organized crime so it's the neil, same apologies neil can i just technical point there sorry you can continue in a sec clemmy has to go at 8 30 uh i think she's got some childcare uh, factors are you saying do you want to have a quick parting word clemmy if you've got to go and then we'll no, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. it's fine uh, it's fine let's just go and then yeah, yeah go, keep, going. Right, keep, going, keep going sorry apologies neil okay it's all right Carry so, on. so the, the organised crime gangs who are controlling those trades in the Netherlands are now the same organised crime gangs which are controlling uh, the importation and the sourcing of the cocaine in Latin America. Cocaine has never been so interconnected. There's never been so few middle people involved. It's, it's a big entity. So it's the same people trading MDMA as are trading in cocaine and, 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 and divvying up those, those supplies in Antwerp and, 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 and various other key ports in in Europe. So we need to see this as about, about financial entities with many diversified products. Um, and then you come back to the same problem, which is the power that that vast wealth, give, wealth gives them. So they're not only are they rich from the cocaine trade, they're rich from the amphetamine trade, from the ketamine trade. So you get ketamine, which is produced primarily in India. You've got the fentanyls, which are, which are made uh, for the opioid industry, which are made in uh, India and, and China, and various other places. The synthetics, you know, the, you could argue that fentanyl actually has a, a much less, a, a much smaller impact on the environment in terms of their production, but the wealth is still corrupting the same people. So it's all about the diversified interconnected businesses. But I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the public health like um, epidemic of fentanyl is like, it's in, insane. Um, what I just want to, yeah, what, one thing about the the and um the synthetic drugs is is I suppose there is this unique element of the agricultural process of the plant based um of cannabis and coca, um in some of these regions and um 
you know, there's colleagues in our coalition who don't want us to focus entirely on the Amazon and really want us to broaden out this story and, and identify that these tactics and these systems are being used in West Africa and Southeast Asia. But in terms of like an entry point to the public, the Amazon, I mean, my four year old knows about the Amazon. So I think that there are two specific drugs in the Amazon that that really the cannabis and coca like that, that from a sort of comms perspective, like that this is this is a we're told consistently um and it is one of the largest carbon sinks on the planet that it is the lungs of our planet um but um to make cocaine you need chemical drugs so you know what what is the process of bringing those in um so it is all interconnected okay i think we got doug doug next hoping to pop in there with a question comment and then we'll we'll come back for 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 winding up comments or anything or get your last comments in if you want or doug over Right on. Um, just real quick, one thing regarding uh, fentanyl. One of the things we've seen is the um, as Woodsy was saying there used to be a bunch of different cartels down in the uh, down in Mexico. Now there are essentially three. And what you have seen is the growth and the strengthening of particular cartels that are moving fentanyl. And as these cartels have moved westward across the U.S., different states. I mean. My home state of Oregon was for a long time an outlier on fentanyl overdoses because we just didn't have that because the because the heroin and other opioids in this state were controlled by other entities. There were a lot of the Asian gangs and the Russian gangs primarily. What you have now has been an influx of Mexican, primarily the Mexican cartels, taking over and moving in the fentanyl. This happened around 2019 and 2020 when there were a spate of shootings and gang killings in the city of Portland. Um, they don't like to talk about this much because it's much easier for the, uh, for the authorities to blame Measure 110, which is the decriminalization measure that went into effect at the beginning of 21. It's an unfortunate coincidence that the influx of fentanyl and the massive increase in overdose deaths that resulted happened at around the same time. And it's, um, but that is one of the things that we're seeing with this um, thing. And it, it, it kind of speaks to another thing, which is the, uh, the creation of the monopolies in a way in a way, the police authorities in my city and in, and in Oregon created this problem by giving control to the gangs that were bringing in the fentanyl. And what you have in every city across my country, and I'm guessing across a lot of yours too, is that creation of the monopoly. It isn't something that's made public. It's not something you're going to find a written record of, and they're not going to admit this to your newspapers. But on the other hand, <laughs> On the real tip, they're dealing, they're making a deal, and this gang gets control of this area, and we're not going to have any shootings, and we're not going to have the violence in the streets, and we're not going to have the gang warfare where you have innocent people being cut down as collateral damage. And instead, you just divvy out territory. And that's, in a sense, goes back to something that, um, that, that, that Woodsy was saying earlier about appealing to their humanity. If I mean, they have kids, they have grandkids, they have kids. That gangster who was holding a knife to your ghoulies with a 12-year-old son in the corner, that's just training him. That's just showing him how to take over because that kid is being groomed to take over. He has it. It's it, it, they're, they're companies like any other. In this case, it's a personally owned business. People have an interest in seeing succession in having their kid take over and continue the dynasty. I mean, I realize it sounds crazy because we're making people into human beings because they are ultimately human beings. And the goal is to achieve wealth, sure, but eventually they're gone. So what are they leaving behind? What they're leaving behind is their kids. I mean, again, I realize it sounds crazy, but if you can't get the authorities to go along and the Bolivian, um, the the Bolivian move to try and have cocaine descheduled is going to take a long bloody time. But um, but in the meantime, there are organizations that are large that have you know that are larger than some national governments and they're ultimately they're people running them ah yeah absolutely doug thanks for giving us that, that perspective it's really important that, that we look at this that how it is on the street or the front lines of the rainforests and the realities of these things like neil has really amazingly uh 
uh, illustrated, you know, but one, one example I want to give, you know, before maybe we come back to Clemmy and Neil, just sum up and we'll, we'll finish up because there's a, I mean, it's a brilliant conversation. We need to keep this conversation going for social and climate and environmental justice. It's not just a drug issue. It's a number one climate solution issue. It's a social justice. It's saving the rainforest, the lungs of our planet issue. And we need to get on it on a, on a kind of cop level. But, you know, um, our current drug policy in this country, we have a situation where the, I think it was the drug policy uh, czar for the uh, for the ruling party, should we say, recently. Her husband also was the major shareholder in something called GW Pharma, my friend who helps cannabis, helps, you know, patients who got cancer learn how to grow their own plants. He was saying, you know, how is it that, you know, street kids are getting nicked in Brixton, but like the Conservative Party's drug czar's husband runs the biggest GW Pharma run you know that runs the biggest amount of medical marijuana and exports it all over the world and that is legal but it's not legal for the for the for somebody who's a who's a sufferer from cancer to grow four patient uh, you know four plants themselves you have the successful example in oregon and i don't know what it is 13 medical states and other states in america where they're taking the money from their cannabis shops and they're putting it into social programs and schools and hospitals and art programs and and they're giving license to people who were arrested to grow and to do these things how do we do it in a socially just way it is going to change we are prohibition will crumble over the next 10 20 30 years how do we accelerate it how do we make it fair and socially just i thought i suppose i'll leave with that thought over to clemmy and neil to do parting comments sum up really fascinating tonight let's keep the conversation and the campaigning going get in touch with each other and the network we'll put the links in uh neil then clemmy for final parting comments over i don't think i could have summarized it any better than you just did to be honest phoenix i thought i thought you put that extremely well so so thank you for that over to clemmy yeah thank you so much um for everyone for staying on an extra half an hour and um i i think you know um the socially just sort of p position of legal regulation is being is being designed as being explored communities policymakers are coming together in in ghana in i mean in all kinds of places um and and reforms are being moved on um i think it's just that I, and this sounds like a poor us, but, I, you know, we are a sector or we are a movement that is a peninsula in the social justice space. Like we are sort of off. We're not integrated, integrated. Neil and I have just been in the States in Arizona for one of the largest drug policy conferences in the US. The racial justice movement is completely aligned with drug policy reform. Racial justice and drug policy are the same movement. It's extraordinary to be in that space. We do not have that same groundswell. We do not have that same understanding that drug policy intersects with housing, health, the environment, um, peace, stability. And that is our, that is the only message, the sort of lasting message I want to give is that drug policy really intersects with every aspect of public and planetary um, sort of health. So beautiful, beautifully put together, uh, guys. And, you know, we really need to get this across to the rest of the environmental community, social justice. It is uh, new, newfangled words of inter sectional but that means it affects everyone of all different races classes cultures uh, and uh, you know levels of our society and it's really important we get some shift here if we want to save the rainforest in time and uh plant the hemp plant the uh the, the kelp and the forests so tune in next week we've got jules doing uh, community climate action how do you get your local parish uh area borough to create their own climate action plan um lots of love thank you so much clemmy absolutely smashed down the park and neil for being one of the bravest people to step forward uh from the worlds that you've been in to tell people about this so let's all campaign and work together big up shane and all the long-term campaigners and all of you around the world around the world who've tuned in from oregon to africa to to ireland big love to warsaw take care guys have a great great time see you next time many thanks guys you give great meeting <laughs> no, no. No. Phoenix. Thanks, Nihil. Thanks, Clemmy. Hey.